Choir, thank you so much for uh, leading us. And if you haven't, choir, thank you so much for uh, leading us. And if you haven't decided to follow Jesus, I hope today you will, and let Him come and lead you wherever He desires to lead you. And you would be open to that. I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and turn to the Book of John. The Book of John. For the past. Uh, couple months, we have been involved in a series called Living Life in God's Word. And we have been taking characters from the scripture and looking at the things that they faced in life because you and I faced the similar things in life. And so how did they take God's Word and deal with the issues that they were facing in life? Well, I, as you see in your bulletin, I was going to be preaching on Peter this morning, but I felt directed to uh, pause that for the next three weeks. And I want us to look at life, but I want us to look at one person's life. And between now and Easter, I want us to look at the life of Jesus and just kind of focus on him and not a, a group of people between now and then. But I just want us between now and Easter just to focus on the life of Jesus. As we come today, we're going to be looking at Jesus, the teacher, uh, that he comes to be with us and he comes to guide us and direct us. And John chapter 17, he's going to instruct us in some things this day as we look at his life and what his life is all about. Next Sunday, we're, we're going to focus upon the tree. Uh, We're going to look at the cross of Christ and what he was going to be facing and the things that he would be going through there. And then on Monday, Thursday, the Thursday before Easter, we're going to be looking at the template that Jesus gave us. We'll be looking at John chapter 13 and we'll be looking at Jesus as he institutes the Lord's Supper. And he does that on that Thursday night before he would face the cross as we'll come together and worship. Then on Sunday morning at the sunrise service, I want us to focus on the tomb, and I'll be preaching on what was taking place during those three days that Jesus was in the tomb, and we'll do that in our sunrise service. And then we'll be gathered together at Tri-County at 10 o'clock, and we're going to be celebrating the triumph of Jesus Christ and his overcoming death, that he indeed is a resurrected Christ. Do you believe this? <laughs> Do you believe it, church? And we're going to gather together and have a great time of celebration as the whole church comes together. So I want us to focus on this one solitary life of Jesus between now and Easter Sunday as we worship together. It has been said that... Uh, we have an opportunity to really see who this solitary life is, of Jesus, of what he's come to do for us. And I want us to begin our time together to look at Jesus and his life as he teaches us some things about himself. Would you stand with me as we read God's word together? We're going to be looking into John chapter 17, but I want to use kind of as our... uh, Focal passage is verses uh, 1 through 5 of John chapter 17. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. As you had given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Father, I pray now that we indeed would see your glory and your grace this morning, that we would see the very power of Jesus lived out in our lives, for we pray it in Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Some have said that the author is unnamed. Others will 
give credit to David Allen Francis that he wrote that poem uh, years ago. He was a preacher, and the poem was entitled, The Solitary Life. It would be about a man. In fact, it would be about a man named Jesus that would come into our life, and he would have an ordinary life like you and I do as he would come and live on earth as you and I live upon earth. But his life would come, and his life would change everything. And David Francis would say that this was an ordinary life that would change all humankind. He said that of Jesus, that he was born in an obscure village, that he was born to a peasant woman, that he grew up in an obscure place, he worked in a carpenter's shop with his dad and for 30 years. And then at age 30, he would come and he would spend three years and he would be an itinerant preacher and go begin to preach. You and I would begin to see that he was there. And it was an amazing thing that he would come and he never wrote a book. He never owned his own home. He never went to college. He never had his own immediate family. He never held an office. It is told that he would come and other than his birth, he would travel no more than 200 miles from the place from where he was born. He never did anything that really accompanied greatness. He had only himself for his credentials of who he was. Goes on to say that while he was still a young man, that the popular tide turned against him. His friends ran away from him. One would deny him. He would be turned over to his enemies. He would go through the mockery of a trial. He would be placed on a tree and he would be nailed to that tree. The only piece of property that he owned was his seamless robe and his executioners would gamble for that robe beneath a cross. When he was dead, he would be taken down and be placed in a barred tomb at the courtesy of a friend. As this was written 1,900 years ago, Francis would say, but I can say today, 20 centuries ago, that he would come to that place and recognize that God is still the centerpiece of all human race. That he is the one, regardless of all the armies that have ever marched, of all the navies that have ever been built, of all the parliaments that ever sat, of all the kings that ever reigned, put all them together, there has been no life that has affected humankind more than this one solitary life. And his name is Jesus. And he comes to us and he wants us to understand what he has given us in life. This morning as we look at Jesus the teacher, three things that I want you to see about his life. The first thing is that I want you to see the priority in Jesus' life. Then we're going to look at the posture of Jesus' life, and then we're going to look at Jesus' present life. John chapter 17 gives us the hint as we look into his word, as we begin to look at about Jesus and the priority of his life. Why would he come into our world? Why would he come and give of himself to us in the passage of scripture that I read to you there in verse 4, Jesus said, as he's talking to the Father, he's in conversation with his heavenly Father, and he, he looks up into heaven and is talking with the Father, and he says, Lord, I have finished the work that you have given me to do. I have completed my assignment of why I would leave heaven and come down to the earth and my hour has now come and soon I'm going to be back with you. But Lord, Father, I have finished the work 
that you called me to do. So what was Jesus' work? What was the priority of his life? What had he finished in order that you and I, we might have life? Well, one thing that I want you to see is of Jesus' priority in life, of his work was, is the place where we recognize that he came to die to self. He came to die to self. Listen to what John would write in Philippians chapter 1. Excuse me, chapter 2, verse 5. He says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, but taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So what did Jesus come to do? He came to die for you and for me. He would come and that he would give his life. He would come and it says that we are to have the mind of Christ. That, the word for mind there is to have the attitude of Christ. It is to think like Christ. Why, why are we trying to get you to read God's word? Why we're, are we trying to get you to memorize God's word? Because the more time that you spend in God's word, the more that you're going to have the mind of Christ, the attitude of Christ in all that you are and all that you do. And it will become your work. Jesus says that we are to deny ourselves. We, we are to die to self as Jesus would come die to self, that he would come and he would die humbly. In fact, it's an amazing thing that Jesus, as he would come in the uh, appearance of man like us, that he would surrender his position. He would be both the deified God, but he took on flesh and blood like we are. And he comes to that place to recognize that he, he gave up all of his deity, his glory to become and take on flesh like us. And he humbled himself in obedience to the Lord so that he could come and die to self. And Paul says not only that, but that he would come and he would leave all the peace in heaven to come into the world. And he would rather than having peace here, he would have and face pain and agony and suffering. It was Jesus who would come and humble himself as he would die to self, that he would be the sacrificial lamb for your life and for my life in order that we might have life eternal with him. It was important that he would come and he would be willing to die for you and for me. And it was one of the priorities of Jesus' work. And Jesus says, my hour has come. And Lord, it's time for me to come and die in order that others might have eternal life forever and forever. In fact, we was obedient to death. Not only did he come to die to self, but he came to deal with your sin. He came to deal with my sin. It was Jesus who would come and he would place the sin upon Calvary's tree the scripture says he would nail it to the cross in order that your sin might be forgiven. That we could come and be forgiven of all the hurt and pain that we put on him. He took it up on himself in order that you might live and I might live and that we could be forgiven of our sins. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. That is the word for to tell us die. It means that the debt, the sin debt, has been paid for all mankind. It was the priority of Jesus coming to us of his life that he would die to self and he would come and deal with your sin and deal with my sin. But not only that, what was the other priority of his life? That he would come to deliver our souls. That he would come in order that we might be saved and that we could live with him forever and forever. And it was the priority of his work. Oh, I'm amazed at uh, the song, It Is Well With My Soul. 
That story uh, bears repeating again, you know, it was written by Horatio Spafford. He was a successful lawyer and a businessman. That They had uh, lived in Chicago, and he had a lovely fam family with his wife, Anna, and they had five children, but they were not free of tragedy themselves in order that one of their young sons would die. But they dealt with that in a very special way. His family was going to be going on a trip and uh, going from the U.S. over to Europe, and they would be able to board a, a French ship, and they would begin to make their way over there, but something came up that Spafford could not go. He had to deal with something within his business that was there, and so he stayed behind, but Anna and the four other children got on that ship and began to make their way to Europe. About four days in, they had a collision. There was another ship that would come and hit that ship. Anna would come and gather her four children on the deck, and she would pray that God would spare them or that God would give them exactly what they needed in order to face what was going to be before them. After she had met with them, 12 minutes later, that ship sunk. 229 out of the 313 people lost their lives. There's one of the sailors that was in a boat that was rowing around trying to find people, and he saw a lady that was on a, a broken piece of the wreckage that was there, and, and it was Anna. And, and he got her up, and four days later, they made their way back to Wales and got there, and she sent a telegram to her husband, Horatio, and she said, saved, saved alone. So Horatio Spafford knew that he needed to get ready. He needed to find his way to get to where his wife was to deal with that. So he got a ticket on the ship, and he's going to be making his way across those waters. And when they came to the place where that ship went down with his four daughters, the captain came and got him and told him that this is where the tragedy had taken place. It was out of that experience that Horatio Wood Spafford would write, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless state and has shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of the glorious thought, my sin, not in part but in the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. And Lord, haste the day when the fate shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound and the sword shall descend, even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. My question to you, the priority of Jesus' life, as he would say to you and to me, is it well with your soul? Do you know that you know Jesus? The priority of his life was come to die to self. It was come to die for your sin to come to deliver your soul in order that we might know that it is well with our soul. The priority of Jesus' life leads me to the posture in Jesus' life. You and I begin to see that what God wants to teach us and what he wants to show us about himself, when you read verse 1 there, it says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son also may be glorified. But Jesus spoke these words as he looked up to heaven. Jesus is praying to the Father. Here is his posture. You know the word uh, posture, I, I can remember Mama saying, uh, sit up right, son, uh, make your back straight, hold your shoulders back, make sure you've got good posture or else you'll, you'll bend over and you'll be crippy and weak and you'll get shorter and shorter. And uh, have good posture, son. Your mom and dad ever tell you to do that? <laughs> I'm sure they did. 
Well, Jesus, the word posture also can be not only are we to have physical health and, and take care of ourselves, but he's talking about posture of position. It's your view. It's your stance that is on something. And the very posture of Jesus, his stance is that he is teaching us how to pray to the Father. And you and I begin to see that we find that Jesus prayed often. In fact, it would be the place that where he would receive his strength. It would be the place where he would find direction for his life. How did you know, how did Jesus know that he had finished the priority of the work of his life? Because he had been in conversation with the Father. God had given him everything that he needed to face whatever he was going to face in this life. And he does the same for us. He will give you strength. He will give you courage. He will give you guidance to face whatever you're going to face in life as well. You and I begin to see that when you read verses 6 through uh, 19 that is there, I don't have time to deal with all that, but Jesus is praying for his disciples, the ones that he had called to come alongside him in order that they might come and grow in their relationship with him. Jesus knew that he was going to be going back to heaven and he was preparing them, he was teaching them and showing them that it was necessary that he go away so the Spirit could come, but they would be the ones to carry on the work, to carry on the priority of his work. Nothing has changed to this very day. God comes and he is praying for us. In fact, verses 20 through through 26 of this high priestly prayer of Jesus, he is praying for us in order that we might come into a meaningful relationship with him, that we might continue the priority of his work. So if we're going to do that, it's important that we have the posture, we have the position, we have the view of Jesus, that we look up to heaven and we cry out to our Father for strength and guidance and help in order that we might carry on his work. Now, what is Jesus praying for us? What, what did he pray for his disciples and what does he pray for us? Look at it there. He, he prays that we will be kept from Satan. Look at verse 13. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may find joy and fulfillment in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So what Jesus is saying to here, he wants us to understand that the world is going to hate him. That's what Satan would come to do to try to take him out. And Jesus is praying for his disciples that they would come to that place and they would be protected from Satan. As I thought about that passage and about that statement, my, my mind immediately went over to 1 Chronicles chapter 4. It is the prayer of Jabez. And chapter 4, 1 Chronicles verses 9 and 10. And listen, it's just, it's just two scriptures in, word, in God's word about Jabez. He, he was from the tribe of Judah. And listen to what he says. Jabez, his name means sorrow or sorrowful, was more honorable than his brothers and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain or in sorrow. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me and that you would be kept from evil and that I may call, not cause pain. So God granted him what he had requested. It's an amazing thing that as Jabez would come of just these two verses in Scripture, we don't know much about him, but he was from the tribe of Judah. He was the descendant from that tribe that is there. But he would come and he would have the privilege to go to God in prayer. And he would pray to him and ask him. In fact, I, I pray this prayer for my grandkids. I pray this prayer for my two daughters. I pray this prayer for my wife. I pray this prayer for you and for me that we would come to that place that when we call upon God, God, would you bless me? God, would you bless my family? Would you bless this church? 
And God, would you enlarge our territory? Would you give us victory in the battles that we're going to be facing in life? God, would you come and put your hand upon me? That is, God, would you guide me? Would you direct me? And God, would you come to that place that you would keep me from evil? That is the evil one. That is from Satan himself. And Jesus comes and prays for us that we might be buffeted from Satan himself. Not only that, he prays for us that we would come and we might be sanctified. Look back at verse uh, 17 of John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And for their saints, I sanctify myself. The word sanctify means to be set apart. It is to come that you don't get caught up in the world, that you don't let the world control you, but you impact the world because if you're not impacting the world, I can tell you the world will impact you. And God says, I want to come and I want to pray for you that you'll be sifted from Satan, but also that you would come and you would be sanctified, that you would be set apart. Set apart to what? Not to a task. Not to a job. Not just something to do. But you would be set apart, not to what, but to whom? It is Jesus. This is his words that we would come and we would have the mind, we would have the attitude of God, and God prays that I would come and you would be protected from the evil one. You would come and you would be sanctified, but also he prays there in verse 18, as you sent me into the world. That word sin is in the same way as God the Father would send Jesus into the world to do the priority of his work. God, he says, Jesus says, I pray God that you would send them into the world also. And God comes to do something he wants to do in our lives in order that we might continue the very work that he has called us to do. And God says, I want you to come. And I'm going to pray that Satan won't control your life. I'm going to pray that you'll be different than the world that is there. And I pray that you'll go out into the world. That you'll look unto the fields. John 35, Jesus says, the fields are white unto harvest. That is, Jesus saw signs of hope and assurance that is there. The harvest was coming. We look unto the fields that are in our community. I can tell you that the fields are white unto harvest the very reason that Jesus would come was summed up in Luke 19.10. I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. That God is saying, as you continue my work, look into the fields that are in our community, for they are now white unto harvest, and that we would go and get in the game. That we would get in the game and be everything that God wants us to be and what he wants us to do. Oh, it was in January... 1929, the story is told about Roy Regals that when the University of California, the Golden Bears, were going to be facing the, uh, the Yellow Jackets from Georgia that was there. They were going to be in the Rose Bowl that was there. And they were down the, uh, on about the 30-yard line and the <laughs> University of California was, and there was a fumble. And Roy Regals picked it up. And he began to make his way and he began to turn and he got hit and he, he turned and he was bounced off of one guy and then all of a sudden he lost his bearings and he started running the wrong way. He was going the wrong way. His quarterback, Benny Lam, he ran fast as he could and he tackled Roy Regals down there on the three-yard line and then all those yellow jackets came and they ended up on the one-yard line. Rather than risk a play, they decided that they were going to punt the ball as they did. And Benny Lam was going to be uh, punting the ball. His, his punt was blocked and the Yellow Jackets got a safety there in the end zone and it cost them two points for Roy Regals running the wrong way. Oh, can you imagine the devastation that he felt? In fact, when halftime would come, he would tell you to Coach Price, Coach, I can't go back in the game. 
I, I've embarrassed you. I've ruined my life. I've ruined your life. I've ruined the university's life. And I can't face that crowd that is out there. And Coach Bryce said, listen, Roy, it's only halftime. Get back and play the game. And they said he got back into the game and he played a stellar second half. Now, California didn't win that day. In fact, they would score a touchdown, but the Yellow Jackets would score a touchdown and their punt would get blocked for the extra point. But they had the two points and the score ended up 8-7. to seven, And they became the Rose Bowl champions. But get back into the life. Get back into the work, Roy. The game is not over. And you and I recognize that for the work of Jesus, his work is not over. We may be later than halftime, but the work, the game is still going on. And Jesus says, church, get into the game. It's not over yet. And we need to come to that place to recognize, to see the fields that are white unto harvest, that we go and seek and save that which is lost, that we go to be everything that we need to do. And will we mess up? Will we fall short? Well, sometimes we run the wrong way. We will. But when that happens, you come and you renew your relationship. You get back to the Heavenly Father and pray. You come and you renew that relationship. You come and you resist Satan. And you come and you get back in the game because the game is not over, church. And we have so much that we need to do. So many people need to be saved. And Jesus would come, the teacher would come to us to see the priority of his work, of his life, in order that we would see his posture that when we're in the game, if we're going to find the strength and courage we need to stay in the game, we come before him and have his same posture and his stance and view and we become before the Father in heaven. And that leads me lastly, not only as we look at Jesus' teacher, we look at the priority of his life, the posture in his life, but I want us to look for just a moment at his present life. What is going on now? Look at verse 11 of John chapter 17. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. Then look at verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. And what God is saying to us, where is Jesus' present life? You remember that when Jesus was resurrected and his disciples were standing on the mount there and Jesus would be going back into heaven, the angel would say, why do you stand here and gaze into Jesus who has gone into heaven? This same Jesus is going to come again one day and he will come in like manner from heaven back to us. So where is Jesus? What is his present life right now? Well, we know where he has gone. He is back with the Father. He is at the right hand of God right now. In fact, he says in verse 24, I desire that they also would be with me whom you gave with me, that where I am we know that where he's gone, but we know that he is on his throne, and one day he's going to come for his own. That's us. And God says, until then, that I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this church? Well, that was pitiful. (laughs) Do you believe this church? Amen. Amen. And God says, my present life is that I'm in the Father's care right now, but one day I'm going to come and get you. That where I am, 
there you may be also for all eternity because of what I did for you. The very priority of my work was to make sure you had a path to where I am. So church, our responsibility is to go and to tell others about the Jesus in his life, about his work in ministry, what he came to do for us. We'll be found faithful in everything that he desires for us. Would you join me as we pray? Father, we thank you for your holy word. For the privilege to come here this morning and to look into your life. And Father, to be reminded again of how much you love us. Father, you told us in this passage of scripture that the Father loves us as much as it loves you, Jesus, as he loves you. What an amazing love. What an amazing grace that is there. Father, give us faith, we pray. Faith in God to be able to be all that you desire for us to be. And may we as the church here at First Baptist Church, Flora, be a light in this community for your glory. Help us to be everything that we need to bring honor to you.